Illinois State of the Race. We had a new one this weekend. In case you missed it, go back and listen to that. A lot of new polling data you might want to check out. It's on uh, our podcast stream, Studios America. Search for that. You'll get that as well as this show every single day. Also, be sure to check out uh, the main show here on YouTube, youtube.com slash Studios America. You can like and comment on the videos, hit the bell for notifications, and follow the page. We really appreciate it. David Bonson is going to be here in a little bit to help us figure out a healthy work-life balance. Uh, good luck teaching us idiots that. Uh, Joe Biden is going to continue to trample on the Constitution to boost his election chances. We kind of know that already, but uh, what he's done this time is fascinating. We're going to start th- by doing the war on fast food. And fast food, of course, is my lifeline. I'm 80% fast food. If you look at me right now, you're like, oh, uh, is that guy uh, McGriddle or is he a human? Who knows at this point? Uh, it's impossible to detect. Um, but they're trying to screw with our fast food, and I don't like it very much. I don't like the war on fast food at all. And it's led by Gavin Newsom. Now, you might not know this, but the French laundry is not fast food. When you can afford $200 steaks, you might not have all that much uh, need for fast food. Now, my particular brand of uh, prosperity means no matter how much money I have, I'm still going to be at McDonald's for breakfast every day because it's freaking delicious. Okay, that's just the way I live. It's the way I roll. And, you know, for the uh, six months I have probably before I keel over, it's going to be fantastic. But some people are going after fast food, saying how bad it is, but really more than anything else, trying to bankrupt it from the inside. California's $20 minimum wage for fast food workers has gone into effect. California's new law boosting the minimum wage for fast food workers in the state to $20 an hour went into effect, uh, this is about a week ago now, impacting restaurants that have at least 60 locations nationwide, except those that make and sell their own bread. (laughs) What carve out did they get there? Like, you know, there's someone that Gavin Newsom knows who has a fast food restaurant. It's like, dude, you're gonna kill me with this thing. Well, you make your own bread, though, so you're okay. We're gonna gonna exempt that for sure, because you make your own bread. Honestly, it's probably cheaper for these guys to make their own bread than to uh, pay everybody $20 an hour. But I digress. Governor Governor Newsom signed the legislation, AB 1228, into law in September. In addition to the pay raises, it also establishes a fast food council, uh, including representatives for both workers and employers that can approve further pay increases and set standards for working conditions. The overall minimum wage for other workers in California is $15.50 an hour, among the highest of any state. The federal minimum wage, which has remained unchanged since 2009, is $7.25 an hour, or $15,080 a year for an employee working 40 hours a week. The median fast food worker in the U.S. earned $13.43 an hour in 2022, while those in California made $16.60 an hour. Uh, the new minimum equates to an annual salary of 41600 By the way, much better to earn 1343 at the average city in the United States than earning 1660 in California. Much better. Again, these policies never seem to work out for anyone except the government officials who can't garner votes from them. Um, raising the minimum wage to $20 an hour. Is there a limit to this? doesn't seem like it. They just keep going up and up and up and up and up. Maybe $50, maybe $100. Someone actually did just request a $50 minimum wage. Uh, But this vote and these votes are always very, very popular. Minimum wage, despite my issues with it, minimum wage hikes are among one of our most popular policy issues that we uh, enter into our discourse. Uh, Very, very popular. 70, 80 percent approval for higher minimum wage. Why is that? Well, Uh, We'll get into that here in a second. But uh, this was a party line vote largely. Democrats, 53 Democrats, uh, or excuse me, 53 um, Democrats voted for it uh, and uh, only 17 Republicans. So the final total was all along party lines. But when you're in California, of course, the party line thing is a real devastator. It's not like the U.S. House where you have a one seat majority. This is an absolute destruction. So they can pass all of their fever dreams. And you see how the state's turning out because of it. You know, I mean, it's it's obvious California's twenty dollar fast food minimum wage balloons menu prices with some change increasing costs by nearly two bucks. Now, what's fascinating about this is there are always consequences uh, to policies like this. As Thomas Sowell says, there's there are no such thing as solutions. There are only trade offs. When you do one thing, you affect the rest of the world and you have uh, other things that are the effect of that. That is something that is known pretty much by everybody. You, you just, you know, you can't just do a benefit analysis. Everyone loves to do a benefit analysis. How does this benefit me? You need to do a cost benefit analysis. 
you got to consider both sides. If you just look at the benefits, then every policy looks good, right? Like, do we want, you know, uh, teachers to earn more? Well, sure. I like teachers. Why not? I want everyone to earn more. Of course, there's a cost to that. And when you're paying the cost, maybe you don't want them to earn that much more. Maybe you're okay with them, you know, uh, getting paid what they they get paid, considering uh, their schedules are on the favorable side sometimes. A lot of people get pissed off when you say stuff like that, but it's all part of realistic policymaking. You have to take these things into consideration. The biggest leap uh, for fast food prices was at Burger King, where a Texas double Whopper meal cost $15.09 on March 29th, already very high, but surged to $16.89 on April 1st, a whopping increase of $1.80 for the same meal. And, you know, people went around and took pictures of the menus uh, for some evidence. Uh, here is the BK menu before. I don't have the double Whopper on there. I don't see the yeah, Texas double Whopper, 18, 1509 there. Uh, Texas double Whopper, uh, 1689 on the next menu. You can see every single price goes up. Uh, $1.89 was the highest, but they all went up, every single thing. And it wasn't just Burger King. It can be mean, evil Burger King. It was also in and out uh, You see the prices go up and up and up. Uh, you know, the double-double uh, went up $0.35. Cents. The cheeseburger, eh, you know, about $0.25. Cents. Everything went up. There was no cost decrease here. And you might say, well, I'm, I'm happy. That's what everyone does. I'm happy spending an extra 35 cents if it'll help people earn more money. Got news for you. That's not what it takes. It takes a lot of people doing it a lot of times. Uh, and of course, that adds up to a lot for people, especially people who might be on the uh, borderline of being able to afford food. If you happen to be someone who needs to go to fast food, not because you're just a fatso like me and like it, but because it's the thing you can afford, well, this really affects people real people with real lives. California minimum wage shocks fast food workers at, as restaurant closes. This is only the beginning, an ex-manager is warning. We know there are trade-offs here. Yes, you can give $20 an hour minimum wage. You're going to get a lot of people pushed to kiosks. A lot of places are going to be like, ah, eh, we don't really have any employees anymore. That's number one. And number two, you'll get a bunch of places that just close or move. Uh, that happens frequently when these policies get implemented. The people who go to the restaurant get hurt. The workers get hurt. Uh, you know, occasionally some workers who are right around that line might be able to, they might be able to absorb the cost of, of these raises. But generally speaking, what happens is they decrease the hours you work and they decrease uh, the amount of employees they have uh, or they raise prices to cover all of it. So or maybe a combination of both. So it really does not work out well. That's not something that might surprise you, but it does surprise people like Gavin Newsom who don't, I mean, who don't really think of these things. But I will say maybe it's not, that's not the right way to think about it. Maybe it's not that they don't think about it. Maybe it's because they're thinking a little bit further down the line. Let's get into that here in a second. But a lot of times we don't talk about what these, the side effects of these decisions are. California schools are now forced to compete with fast food industry for workers after the minimum wage hike. Demand for school meals is higher than ever in California, the first state to guarantee free meals for all students, regardless of their family's income. And demand is projected to fuel an increase of more than 70 million extra meals in California schools this year compared to 2018, according to the State Department of Education. But these jobs typically have lots of turnover and are harder to fill. The minimum wage boost for fast food workers could make that even more difficult. Got it? So... First of all, they give out free lunches to everyone, including the you know billionaire tech bros, right? Their, their kids are getting free school lunch from California schools. If you think that makes any sense, you're nuts, okay? But they give it out to everybody. So, of course, what does that do? Increases the cost massively of the school lunch program that they want you to pay for. Then they also have all these employees. Well, they've now raised... The price is over here to $20 an hour for fast food. Now, you can either scoop slop to a bunch of fifth graders or you can scoop slops to fat people like me. You can do one of the two. One of them is going to pay you probably $10 an hour more or at least 5 bucks an hour more. Which one would you choose? Now, you might not want to deal with me, and that's an understandable uh, decision you've made. But I will say... Why wouldn't you leave and go to the fast food restaurant? Well, what does that mean? That means the schools have to increase their cost to keep up and keep these employees. So now you're competing in that market. You've now lost your employees or you're paying more for a program that costs more. Guess who gets to pay all of that at the end? You do. And you're the victim, if, especially if you're in California, but everywhere has at least a dash of this. You're the victim of these policies. You're the one being victimized here. 
Um, you know, this goes from generally government spending all the way down. I mean, you know, if you just go generally government spending, you look at that and you see the inflation piece of it. Um, I, you know, I can't give you all the details here because there's too much to go for. But how far does $100 go at the grocery store after five years of food inflation? From beef to mayo, consumers continue to spend more uh, and buy less. This is an interactive thing. Maybe we can tweet this out uh, at Students America. Because you need to go through it and just play with it a little bit because you get to see all the prices just go up, 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 up. I could show you examples of it, but you should really go play with the actual interactive. It's, it's worth it just so you understand. So we have all that going on. We even have now a bird flu scare. Largest U.S. egg producer is shuttering its doors after the H5N1 virus was found in chickens. That's going to make your egg prices go up. Of course, eggs go into you know, almost every recipe. So all this is adding up on top of people, on top of people, on top of people. McDonald's prices are up uh, over 100 percent in the last decade. Uh, I mean, I remember I remember there was a uh, back in the day used to uh, take a break from school. And I, might, I know you might be thinking, wow, you skipped some education. That's shocking. No, yeah, it's true. And we would leave uh, high school and we would drive to the local McDonald's. And they had if you bought eight hamburgers, not cheeseburgers, hamburgers, eight hamburgers, exactly five dollars. And I remember it because it was $5 to the penny. So you'd get eight hamburgers for $5. And back in the day, me and my friend usually split a bag of them. You get four of them each. That was a good snack back in the day. Okay? Again, not, I, I, my arteries are almost all hamburger at this point in my life. The point of that is, I don't know, could you even get a hamburger for $5 now? I don't know. I mean, it's, they're freaking expensive. I can tell you that. Uh, certainly you're not getting eight of them for five bucks anymore. These things have changed quite a bit, and they're going up and up and up and up. McDonald's has jacked up the menu prices by more than 100% over the course of just one decade, more than three times the rate of inflation, according to a research report. Chicago-based burger giant has been slammed with customer complaints over eye-popping prices, including $18 for a Big Mac meal in Connecticut, as well as $7.25 for an Egg McMuffin and $5.69 for a side of hash browns. Now a quarter pounder with cheese meal goes for $11.99, more than double the $5.39 it costs in 2020. 2014, according to a study by Finance Buzz, which cited average prices nationwide. One of our leading academic sources, that Finance Buzz. It's true. Um, but it is one of those things where you wonder, where is this all going? Like, why, for example, are only fast food workers have to get paid 20 bucks an hour? Why isn't this for every restaurant? Why is that? I mean, it doesn't make much sense. Why is that happening? Like, why would you know, a, a, an upscale, more upscale restaurant have to pay their employees less. Doesn't make much sense, but it is the case. Now, it's funny because it, what happens here, of course, it targets uh, people who are workers at these places. You know, a lot of them, I got news for you. And, I, 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 and I'm not saying this because I'm being mean. I'm not saying this because I'm demeaning people. I worked at a fast food restaurant, and I can tell you this. I wasn't worth $20 an hour. I was barely worth the $3 an hour or $4 an hour or $5, whatever it was that they were paying me. All I remember is not being a very good employee, okay? I was not worth it. And the fact is, if they needed to pay people $20 an hour at my restaurant, I would have been fired. Probably justly so. I mean, eventually I was. But that was just because I didn't show up to work because I wanted to go trick-or-treating on Halloween. That's a totally different story. As a you know, high school student, you want to go trick-or-treating, right? People still do that when you're... In high school? I know I did. Anyway, uh, the point is that once you raise the uh, minimum wage uh, prices really high, what you get is the actual reality hitting you in the face. Uh, Thomas Sowell himself pointed this out. Unfortunately, the real minimum wage is always zero, regardless of the laws, and that is the wage that many workers receive in the wake of creation or escalation of a government-mandated minimum wage because they lose their jobs or fail to find jobs where they can enter the labor force. Making it illegal to pay less than a given amount does not make a worker's productivity worth that amount. And if it is not, that worker is likely, excuse me, unlikely to be employed. That's from his uh, basic economics book. The issue there, of course, is when you raise prices like this, people get fired. And this is part of a long-term strategy. This is not just a thing. This is not just, oh, well, this is just another dumb policy of the Democrats. This is something where they've realized it's hard to sell socialism, if you will, big government policies to the American people. They don't want them. It's against their foundations. It's against their culture. They want to be able to do things on their own, make it on their own. They believe in the free market. But 
they're also nice. And in this particular instance, that's a problem because it's hard to sell them on a giant government welfare program. It's hard to sell them on, hey, uh, we should destroy the free market. But it's easy to sell them on we should pay people $20 an hour because they're nice. People are nice and they think, yeah, they should get 20 bucks an hour. Why not? That's not that much. All these big corporations, they can afford it. So you get 70 and 80 percent approval ratings on these changes. And then you have massive problems with the economy afterward. Another one of Thomas Sowell's book, Applied Economics, and the subtitle is more important here, Thinking Beyond Stage One. Stage one, when you raise the minimum wage, is one thing. Oh, well, those people get more money. End of story. Well, thinking beyond stage one means, well, what happens to the business? What do they do to react to this? What are the consequences long term? And if you might think they haven't thought that out, I think you're wrong on this one. Because the truth is they have thought this out. The left has thought this out. And the way they've thought this out is it's much easier to move toward the policies that we want. Government control, dependency of the average person on government. We can move that way not by trying to pass a socialist program at the top, but by instead passing something like a minimum wage issue that's very popular, that winds up rising and rising and rising, getting more and more people out of the workforce because they don't have the experience necessary for these high minimum wage rates, and then they are dependent on the government, and you've created the need for a program. They'll beg you for it when they're in that position. You've created the need for more dependency, and you can reverse engineer the policies that you want, and you know who goes along with it? Lots of Republicans, lots of independents, and of course, every Democrat. This is a much better way to build a path to socialism than actually trying socialism. Just create the minimum wage going through the roof, and you're going to be able to get 80% of the work done, and people will cheer you for it. Higher fast food prices mean more employees are laid off, mean more people turn to the government for help. Being nice is a good instinct. Being nice is not a policy. We have to stop thinking about how nice we are in government policy. You want to be nice with your money? Good. That might mean something very, very significant for you and maybe your future, eternal future. Who knows? But what I will say is it's not a policy to say, you know what, we should just take everybody's money and give it to whoever government officials think should be the likely target this week. Just because you're being nice to people does not mean you're crafting policy that actually works. Politicians are taking advantage of good-hearted people, voters in the mill, voters even on the right, who don't think these things through. They don't think beyond stage one. They think stage one, we're helping some people get a little bit more money. Are you? It doesn't seem to work for any of these people long term. And what it seems to do is make it worse for everyone else, the people that need to go to a fast food restaurant because they want some cheap, hot, delicious, good food. Uh, you know what? Maybe you don't like the food at fast food, but a lot of people do look to this for an occasional treat for their kids. And now they can't go there as often. They can't. They can't afford it. Uh, that might not be the biggest deal to you. But when some of those employees are out, of, those employees are out of work, they can't find work. And now you're supporting their lifestyle. Maybe that'll hit you then. Maybe it'll hit you long down the road when these places go out of business. You don't have the choices that you want. Your taxes are 60, 70, 80 percent. At some point, it'll hit you. It's not stage one. It might be stage five or 12 or 18. But the bottom line is if you don't think beyond stage one, you get destroyed by it. If you're anything like me, you have a tendency to put things off until the last minute. But one thing you cannot wait on is life insurance. You just don't know what's around the corner. Choose life insurance through Ladder today to take care of the problem. Get it off your plate right now. Ladder is 100% digital. There's no doctors, there's no needles, there's no paperwork. You can apply for up to $3 million in coverage or less, you know, and just get a few questions about your health in an application. You just need a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart, smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out if you're instantly approved. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel any time. You can get a full refund if you change your mind in 30 days. They make this super easy. Ladder policies are issued by insurers with the long-proven histories of pay, playing, uh, paying claims. They've got like A and A plus from A and best. Uh, rating. So go to ladderlife.com slash do ladderlife.com slash do see if you're instantly approved L A D D E R life.com slash do it's ladderlife.com slash stew. 
I'm happy to welcome David Bonson to the program. He's the founder and managing partner of the Bonson Group, a contributor to National Review and author of Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life, a fascinating read wherever you can pick up your books. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming on the program. Well, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, your book's great, and it, it, it takes on a topic that is like, I don't know, we don't take seriously enough, I think would be my, my end summary of this. It's fascinating because... You know, work, of course, is important when it comes to boring economics and productivity needs. That's all vital. But you kind of look at it as what it means to the soul. Can you kind of go into why you decided to, to write this book? Yeah, you're exactly right. I do think it has tremendous economic importance. And, and I've studied this for about 25 years, the importance of labor productivity. But that doesn't animate me. It, in other words, it isn't what it motivated me to actually write the book. It is existential, it, it, it is spiritual in, in the sense that I think we're talking about those things that fulfill mankind, that make the good life possible for us. And so we're living in a day and age when people talk about work as if it were the thing keeping people from finding real joy and meaning. This was a very Marxist idea that work was in the way of the, the worker being able to find true peace and happiness. And I believe work represents a path to a fulfilling life. That's what motivated me to write the book. Mm. I mean, I, I think we could all kind of understand that as a feeling, right? Like we all might want to go on vacation and we all want to spend more time with our kids, with our family. And work does sometimes get in the way of that. But I think if you look at it as this like barrier to actual life, you talk about it in the book about work-life balance and how that's sort of a fallacy, right? Like it's, it shouldn't be I have work sometimes and, 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 and life other times. Work is an important part of life. And if we don't recognize that, we're not living to our full expectations. Right. Uh, Work-life balance implies that work and life are at odds with one another instead of work being a healthy component and a vital component of life. It's the only thing, by the way, that we talk about as if it's in tension with the underlying thing of our life. Nobody has ever used the term marriage life balance. Mm. They don't go home and tell their spouse, oh, I can't talk to you right now. I'm doing a little marriage life balance. I don't think they'd try it a second time. <laughs> so really work has become something that we view as expendable, we view resentfully, and ultimately this era we're living in where there seems to be intensified alienation, uh, anxiety, mental health issues, drug and alcohol abuse, depression. I, I accept that that is true of the moment in which we're living in, but I don't accept that work is the cause of those things. I believe in many cases, work is a solution. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you talk about early in the book is this, um, how we're spending our time these days. And we're not spending our time with other people as often. This is a really interesting cultural change. Uh, Derek Thompson has a great stat looking at the time use survey and, and says that, now women, I think in their 20s, uh, spend more time, active time engaging with their cats than they do other human beings. This is according to the data that the women are providing. Uh, this is a massive change. And I don't know, it, it seems like it would follow pretty obviously that depression, anxiety, and all these other effects would follow right behind it. I mean, we've changed the way that humans interact completely. And this is why I don't think the subject of work can be only understood in terms of um, economic data, that what you just described is an anthropological thing. It has to do with what we believe about the human person. And I believe the human person was made to be in community with one another, that we were made to have intimate and, connect and, and true relationships with, with other humans. Uh, the animal kingdom cannot meet those needs. And, and most people intuitively know that. People love their pets and, and all that can, is fine. But when you're talking about that deeper level of connectivity, we were made by God to um, be in relationship with one another, to, there's obviously the marriage relationship, there's children, but even socially, the communities we form. And when you start talking about work, you're serving those communities. You're producing goods and services that meet the needs to an external audience. 
So work all at once fulfills our internal um, existential purpose to be useful, and it does so by meeting the needs of others. It should be no surprise to us that in a humanistic framework uh, that is very progressive, uh, people not only are disinterested in what that means economically, they're disinterested in what it means spiritually. Mm. Uh, you mentioned uh, kind of the start of this being uh, a Marxist belief, uh, which of course leads me immediately to Bernie Sanders. Um, Bernie Sanders is creating, he wants to create this, he's proposing a 32-hour work week. And it's one of those, you know, a lot of these policies sound great right off the top. We talked, we started the show today talking about the $20 minimum wage and why, why that sounds wonderful to most people. We're being nice to people. We're giving them more money. But it, the, the downstream effects of it are so negative. The same thing here. Like, I think most people would look at 32-hour week. Wow, that's less than I'm working now, maybe. Uh, it'd be a lot, it would be great. I could, another eight hours would be fantastic during the week. But, like, Obviously, the, the problem with the government implementing that is one side of this. But secondarily, is it the right move for us to be work, moving away from work more and more? I mean, is the goal to get to zero hours of work eventually? Well, therein lies the rub. Uh, is this better for humanity? Is it better for a good life? And if you believe that mankind exists um, as Marx did, as Rousseau did, uh, and apparently as Bernie Sanders does, for leisure and recreation, then why stop at 32? Let's go all the way to zero. Um, that's the thing about a 32-hour work week. It can't be created by policy because just like the minimum wage, there's nothing you can do about the zero problem. Zero is always the minimum wage, and zero is always the hours worked if one cannot get or does not have work. Mm. It also can't be a maximum. Maybe government policy can say, I'm not allowed to ask my employees to stay more than 32 hours, but I'm allowed to stay more than 32 hours. Elon Musk is not going to stop at 32 hours. Jeff Bezos is not going to stop at 32 hours. So they say that they are so worried about wealth inequality and income inequality. Do they think that the entrepreneurs and risk takers and creators in our economy are gonna stop at 32 hours, it's absurd. Yeah. The reality is that they are wrong on the most important philosophical piece. What brings us the good life? And what brings us a good life is not less work, it's more work, it's more useful activity. What do you make of the, uh, of the, of the idea of, this, of a market solution bringing 32 hours? I mean, we have seen by, by the market a, a decrease in hours worked over long periods of time. I mean, there, is, there used to be 60 and 80 hours a week, and we've, we have adapted to a, a different style. Is that, is that bad that we've cut that much? And if we, if we were to, let's say AI brings in a revolution that is productivity able to get us all the work that we need to get done in 32 hours, I mean, is that that bad of a thing? Well, here's the problem is we're measuring the amount of hours that are worked, but we're not measuring the productivity. Mm. So here's my question. Why is the economy with the cloud and with the digital computing and with AI and with the greatest technological advancements in history over the last 16 years grown at one and a half percent per year? And for 70 years before that, from World War II to 2007, we grew at double that at 3.1 percent per year. So why are we getting no more output with greater uh, resources and technology? Yes, we're working less hours, but we're not producing anymore. Um, and that, to me, is the trade-off. I want to see more productivity. I want to see more dynamism. That brings back jobs that we say have left. Those jobs are there. We have to be more mobile, dynamic in the way that we produce in the society. And ultimately, if it's true that AI is going to help us to get more done with less, I've written a few books. I wrote them all on a computer. My late father wrote several books in the 70s and 80s. He wrote them on a typewriter. So I'm all for getting more work done with less output, less you know, uh, sweat, if you will. But then let's actually take that through to its logical conclusion and get more things done that then we, allows us to move on to doing more still. That's the beauty of work. There's always more to be done in cultivating this great garden God has given us to cultivate. Mm. Yeah, and you do talk about uh, God and faith quite a bit in the book and, and, and its important ties to work. I mean, I think the worldly perspective is that uh, faith and God and religion are at odds with capitalism, are at odds with profit, are at odds with working for money. That's like the bad side of life. 
you talk about this a lot in the book that actually these what we do and what we think of now as capitalism is really consistent with what we see in scripture. And it is true that I prefer the term free enterprise or a free economy, a market economy. I think that capitalism was Marx's attempt to use a pejorative to make it sound like all we care is about capital and that capital is a means to the end, but it's not the end. The end I believe in is human flourishing. And I think humans flourish when they are both free and virtuous. So I, in a lot of ways, I blame the right because they have not defended capitalism the right way. We've talked about it in a greed is good context that is more atomistic and humanistic, where my defense of free enterprise is rooted to my love of humanity, my belief that God, it is faith-centered. God made us to be free and take advantage of our rational, reasonable, and creative faculties to do great things. For the government to come in and impede that and intervene in that is what I'm against. I'm against central planning and a progressive view of the economy for that reason. But it's not because I'm trying to accumulate more capital. It's because I'm trying to accumulate more goods and services that meet the needs of humanity. That's what output needs to be understood to be, a better life for all. Hmm. we got about one more minute left, David. Uh, Can you give me a, a minute on the modern idea of what retirement is? On, it is very modern because uh, retirement for thousands of years was called death. <laughs> and, 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 and now, uh, because mortality is longer, thank God, and because we have more prosperity as a society, uh, the baby boomers entered the workforce um, with this idea that they'd one day be able to retire. And that was the first time in history. And I think it's a good thing that we have more flexibility and more freedom. But the idea that work is something you do for the purpose of not having to do it anymore is fundamentally false. And it's led to a lower view of work from the children that baby boomers had, millennials and so forth. And ultimately, I think that someone, look, a different age and stage of life, people are gonna turn down the knob a little, vacation more, spend more time with grandkids. But being totally removed, from useful activity, I don't think that vision of retirement is a good one at all. Mm. David Bonson, uh, be sure to ca- get a copy of the book. It's called Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life, which is available now wherever you get your books. It's a great read and something that can change your perspective, uh, not only on your day-to-day, but on society in general. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. One of the things we talk about often is being prepared. The pandemic, I think, changed our our viewpoint on this. Like, hey, we don't have any toilet paper. What do we do? Um, There's all these shortages that happened. They didn't only hit products, though. They also hit medical supplies. Uh, As of March, even today, there are 200 drug shortages here in America. And, you know, we could see this getting worse before it even gets better. Healthcare experts have pointed to shortages, uh, domestic uh, production, the drug supply chain, Security Act, all these things you need to watch in the future. But why not just prepare your family? I don't even have to worry about all that. Who who cares what drugs are in shortage? Get the basics for you. The Jace case is here to make sure that you get five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. Look, we hope the worst doesn't come. You hope your pharmacy is going to carry everything that you need. But we've seen recently that that's not always the case. Why not be prepared with the basics with the Jace case? They they can do all sorts of stuff for you. You can customize this in a million different ways. You can get uh, get, uh, gift cards to buy uh, Jace cases for your family family as well, and they can customize it on their own. Just go to Jace Medical. Be prepared for these things. Use the code STU at checkout. We've had massive innovation in the medical field that have taken, you know, illnesses that used to wipe out populations and have put them in the rearview mirror if we have access to our basic medication. So get access to those. It's the promo code is Jace at JaceMedical.com. J-A-S-E Medical.com. Promo code is STU. You made that endorsement in 2020. Are you happy with the state of America? Am I happy with the state of America right now? Well, that answer is no. Do I believe we're going to get better? I I believe in that. I'm an optimistic guy, and I I believe we can get better. Um, The endorsement that I made uh, years ago with Biden was one I thought was the best decision for me at that time. And I thought back then, when we talk about, hey, uh, you know, I'm in this position uh, where I have some influence, and 
it's my job then. I felt like that then. It's my job now to exercise my influence and share with this. This is who I'm going to endorse. Am I going to do that again this year? That answer is no. <laughs> There you go. That's The Rock talking about his endorsement of 2020. So much to take from that clip. Uh, number one, you just have to revel in the fact of, of watching Will Kane, uh, die-hard die Cowboys fan, having to do that interview inside the confines of Lincoln Financial Field with beautiful Eagles green laid out behind him. That's the part I liked about it. But Ro The Rock is making a pretty interesting calculation here. He's not necessarily saying, like, oh, now I'm pro-Trump or I think Biden's the worst guy ever. He's more of just saying, like, I should stay out of this. I should be a positive you know, a uh, force for the future and not divide people. He went on to talk about the division in politics. I think that's a good instinct. I mean, he does, he comes off pretty well, uh, I, I think, in these interviews. And I think he's the type of person who, um, I don't know that he has the chops to do the politics or want to do politics, uh, but seems like a smart guy that I think people like. And he's, uh, I, don't, I don't know that he'd ever run. And I don't, you know, when, usually when people announce they're running, that's when it all falls apart. So it's always great. It's like the backup quarterback syndrome. It's like everyone sounds kind of good until they announce they're running and then everyone hates them. That's pretty much what was, what's going on with that. But I doubt he'll ever run, but it's kind of an interesting point. It, look, just go back to be, he's a star. You're liked by both sides. Don't get involved in this nonsense. Trust me, as a guy who's involved in it every day, stay the hell away. It's just not worth it. Uh, Biden, by the way, has, uh, he knows he's lost maybe the rock, so he's going to try to buy people's votes. Uh, he's going to announce a new student debt relief plan. This, of course, has been overturned by the Supreme Court uh, multiple times. He's going to keep just trying things over and over and over again, different little strategies to try to hack away at the system and at our constitutional republic. I mean, uh, there's no... People talk about stuff with Biden all the time that's unconstitutional. I don't know why this doesn't get more atten attention. He's been shut down by the Supreme Court multiple times on this stuff and just keeps going back to the well over and over again. And everyone kind of shrugs their shoulders. I guess it's a boring policy issue that no one cares about. But he is going to try to, uh, get, you know, probably get shut down again by the courts. Now, it's interesting because a key day for this particular plan is November 1st. Four days before the election. No, he's not trying to buy votes at all. It won't get overturned until after the election. But he's not trying to buy votes at all. By the way, by coincidence, he will start talk about uh, he will talk about his student debt relief in Wisconsin after the primary voting delivered warning signs, as well as the polls have not been good for him in Wisconsin. Again, that's a state he should win. I mean, Democrats should be able to win Wisconsin. It's the home of progressivism, for God's sake. But. They've lost a couple times in a row there. That does not look good. And part of the reason might be this. Donald Trump is, he's got a theory, okay? Uh, the theory is that Joe Biden might be on cocaine. And you might say, hey, wait a minute, that's a crazy theory. But say, hang with me for a second here. He says this. I think what happened is, you know, the white stuff they happened to find, which happened to be cocaine in the White House. I don't know. I think something's going on there because I watched the State of the Union and Biden was all jacked up at the beginning. Hmm. By the end, he was fading fast. Hmm, there's something going on there. I want a debate. I think debates with him at least should be drug tested. I want a drug test. Now, add on to the fact that they actually found cocaine in the White House. Everyone blamed Hunter Biden, but how can we rule Joe out? I'm just asking. These are just questions I'm asking. I know a lot of people think, well, it couldn't possibly be uh, cocaine because people on cocaine are alert. And that's a good point. But you're not on cocaine all the time. You don't wake up and do cocaine all day. You do it in those moments. You're about to go out. Maybe you're about to have a big speech in front of America. You do the cocaine and uh, by the end of the speech, you're coming down. I don't know. I think it's uh, worth, uh, look, he can submit to a quick drug test. That's no big deal, right? I mean, they always are accusing Donald Trump of being on drugs. We'd know both ways. It's just super, super fair for both sides. History, economics, the great works of literature, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. Gosh, we need to learn more about that. Don't I mean, did you learn anything about that when you were in school? Probably not the right things if you did at all. Um, if you did learn something, maybe you just need a, you know, a little bit of a refresher course. Time and technology have changed quite a bit, but they have not changed the basic fundamental truths about the world and our place in it. That's why I'm excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subjects. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, so much more, even the rise and fall of the Roman Republic. Uh, you can do this with uh, Hillsdale. Hillsdale's uh, online courses are available for free. 
for free. That means zero dollars. The courses are self-paced, so you can start whenever and wherever. You can get started today at hillsdale.edu slash stew. You can get started there. It's free to get uh, you know, get started. It's very easy. Just go to Hillsdale. Uh, get, get this done. Why not learn about this stuff, especially the fact that they're giving away for free? Take advantage of this before they come to their senses. Hillsdale.edu slash stew. Hillsdale.edu slash stew. It's Hillsdale College. If you watch the show, you know I'm concerned about some of this DEI stuff that's going on. I don't like it. I don't think it's good. I want to go back to normie capitalism. Um, but, you know, I, I'm concerned about it. I, all the stuff. Like, do I want Dylan Mulvaney on my Bud Light can? No, I don't, I don't want that. However, when it affects something like the FAA, air traffic control, our, our aviation industry, I get really concerned because I don't want to be 40,000 feet in the air and I have someone who worked on the plane who was put there because of their skin color. Right? I want people who are there because of their merit. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this documentary that I'm going to be, I'm going to be actually leaving tomorrow. I'm going to be out for a few days doing a new documentary for Blaze Originals on what's going on with DEI and some of the other aspects that are going on with our aviation system. The good part about that is I get to fly all around the country to go there. And I was on looking at my flight schedule, and I'm like, well, at least I'm on a, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm flying Southwest. You know, they haven't had any problems yet. Southwest flight from Denver makes emergency landing after a mechanical issue, airline says. Here's the picture. Uh, this is uh, the flight, uh, the wing kind of like looks like it's about to peel off. Luckily, they were able to land. Nothing too bad happened. And I think, generally speaking, like we do have a relatively, uh, compared to the rest of the world, safe aviation industry. But, like, that's something we need to really protect and make sure we don't let slip away. That's what I'm concerned about. So we're going to be going all over the country. I'm in a bunch of different uh, cities and states over the next week uh, talking to senators and insiders and whistleblowers and all sorts of stuff. It's going to be a great episode. I think you're really going to like it. It's going to be coming up on Blaze Originals in the, current, uh, in the coming months. I know we have other stuff coming up on the voting system and a bunch of other topics. It's a great series if you haven't watched any of these left uh, yet. Uh, so I'll be out for a couple days this week, but we'll uh, be back in, uh, in a little while. And I'll give you an update on where we are and when it's coming out. Back in a second. Okay, so here's what happened. Uh, today was Eclipse Day, and it hit, came right over our studios here. We're right in the path of totality. Got to check out the full eclipse. It was pretty cool. We kind of walked outside together. If you were watching on Instagram Live, I don't know if it's still up there or not, but you can check it out. Uh, we walked outside, and we looked nor up to the sky for a while. So it was fascinating video. Uh, but it was really cool. I mean, it's one of those things that happens only once in a while when these, you know, the one celestial object, you know, perfect confluence with the other. Uh, it's pretty cool, right? Well, we have another one of those. It's called Cicada Geddon. Cicada Geddon is here. There's two broods of cicadas. They, one comes out every 13 years, one comes out every 17 years. They're coming out together, but it gets worse. Why? Yeah, you're going to have bugs all over the place. It's going to be really, really creepy. But this is where you're much, much worse. Hypersexual zombie cicadas that are infected with sexually transmitted fungus are going to come out and emerge this year. So if you thought your problems were bad now, if you thought, oh, gosh, the Israel's on fire, you got the Ukraine situation, inflation, the border, Afghanistan, all these things, you've also got zombie cicadas with STDs right around the corner. No big deal. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs>